Chapter Sixteen of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken chapter sixteen the blushful mystery one sex hygiene the literature of sex hygiene once so scanty and so timorous now piles mountain high there are at least a dozen formidable series of books of instruction for all inquirers of all ages beginning with what every child of ten should know and ending with what a woman of forty-five should know and they all sell amazingly scores of diligent authors some medical some clerical and some merely shrewdly chautauqua grow rich at the industry of composing them one of these amateur Havelock Ellis's had the honor during the last century of instructing me in the elements of the sacred sciences. He was then the pastor of a fourth-rate church in a decaying neighborhood, and I was sent to his Sunday school in response to some obscure notion that the agony of it would improve me presently he disappeared and for a long while i heard nothing about him then he came into sudden prominence as the author of such a series of handbooks and of the chief stockholder it would seem in the publishing house printing them by the time he died a few years ago he had been so well regarded by a just god that he was able to leave funds to establish a missionary college in some remote and heathen land this holy man i believe was honest and took his platitudinous compositions quite seriously regarding other contributors to the literature it may be said without malice that their altruism is obviously corrupted by a good deal of hocus-pocus some of them lecture in the chautauquas peddling their books before and after charming the yokels others being members of the faculty seem to carry on medical practice on the side yet others are kept in profitable jobs by the salacious old men who finance vice crusades it is hard to draw the line between the mere thrifty enthusiast and the downright fraud so too with the actual vice crusaders the books of the latter like the sex hygiene books are often sold not as wisdom but as pornography true enough they are always displayed in the show window of the small town methodist book concern but you will also find them in the back rooms of dubious second-hand bookstores side by side with the familiar scarlet-backed editions of rabelais margaret of navarre and balzac's droll tales some time ago in a book advertisement headed snappy fiction i found announcements of my battles with vice by virginia brooks and life of my heart by victoria cross the former was described by the publisher as a record of personal experiences in the fight against the gray wolves and love pirates of modern society the book was offered to all comers by mail one might easily imagine the effects of such an offer but even the most serious and honest of the sex hygiene volumes are probably futile, for
for they are all founded upon a pedagogical error that is to say they are all founded upon an attempt to explain a romantic mystery in terms of an exact science nothing could be more absurd as well attempt to interpret beethoven in terms of mathematical physics as many a fatuous contrapuntist indeed has tried to do the mystery of sex presents itself to the young not as a scientific problem to be solved but as a romantic emotion to be accounted for the only result of the current endeavor to explain its phenomena by seeking parallels in botany is to make botany obscene two art and sex one of the favorite notions of the puritan mullahs who specialize in this moral pornography is that the sex instinct if suitably repressed may be sublimated into the higher forms of idealism and especially into aesthetic idealism that notion is to be found in all their books upon it they ground the theory that the enforcement of chastity by a huge force of spies stool pigeons and police would convert the republic into a nation of incomparable uplifters forward lookers and artists all this of course is simply pious fudge if the notion were actually sound then all the great artists of the world would come from the ranks of the hermetically repressed that is from the ranks of puritan old maids male and female but the truth is as everyone knows that the great artists of the world are never puritans and seldom even ordinarily respectable no virtuous man that is virtuous in the y m c a sense has ever painted a picture worth looking at or written a symphony worth hearing or a book worth reading and it is highly improbable that the thing has ever been done by a virtuous woman the actual effect of repression lamentable though it may be is to destroy idealism altogether the puritan for all his pretensions is the worst of materialists pass through his sordid and unimaginative mind even the stupendous romance of sex is reduced to a disgusting transaction in physiology as artist he is thus hopeless as well expect an auctioneer to qualify for the sistine chapel choir all he ever achieves taking pen or brush in hand is a feeble burlesque of his betters all of whom by his hog's theology are doomed to hell three a loss to romance perhaps the worst thing about this sex hygiene nonsense has accomplished is the thing mourned by agnes repelier in the repeal of reticence in america at least innocence has been killed and romance has been sadly wounded by the same discharge of smutty artillery the flapper is no longer naive and charming she goes to the altar of god with a learned and even cynical glitter in her eye the various schoolgirl of to-day fed upon forel sylvanus stahl reginald wright kaufman and the freud books knows as much as the midwife of eighteen eighty five and spends a good deal more time discharging and disseminating her information all this of course is highly embarrassing to the more romantic and ingenious sort of men of whom i have the honor to be one we are constantly in the position of general michener 
in Shaw's one actor, press cuttings, when he begs Mrs. Farrell, the talkative charwoman, to reserve her confidences for her medical adviser. One often wonders, indeed, what women now talk of to doctors. Please do not understand me here. I do not object to this new freedom on moral grounds, but on aesthetic grounds. In the relations between the sexes, all beauty is founded upon romance. All romance is founded upon mystery, and all mystery is founded upon ignorance, or, failing that, upon the deliberate denial of the known truth. To be in love is merely to be in a state of perpetual anesthesia, to mistake an ordinary young man for a Greek god, or an ordinary young woman for a goddess. But how can this condition of mind survive the deadly matter-of-factness which sex hygiene and the new science of eugenics impose? How can a woman continue to believe in the honor, courage, and loving tenderness of a man after she has learned, perhaps by affidavit, that his hemoglobin count is a hundred and seventeen per cent, that he is free from sugar and albumen, that his blood pressure is a hundred and twelve over seventy nine, and that his Wasserman reaction is negative. Moreover, all this new-fangled frankness tends to dam up, at least for civilized adults, one of the principal wellsprings of art, to wit, impropriety. What is neither hidden nor forbidden is seldom very charming. If women, continuing their present tendency to its logical goal, end by going stark naked, there will be no more poets and painters, but only dermatologists and photographers. 4. Sex on the Stage The effort to convert the theatre into a forum of solemn sex discussion is another abhorrent by-product of the sex hygiene rumble-bumble. Fortunately, it seems to be failing. A few years ago, crowds flocked to see Rios Les Avery's, but today it is forgotten, and its successors are all obscure. The movement originated in Germany with the production of Frank Wedekind's Frühlings Erwachen. The Germans gaped and twisted in their seats for a season or two, and then abandoned sex as a horror and went back to sex as a comedy this last is what it actually should be at least in the theatre the theatre is no place for painful speculation it is a place for diverting representation its best and truest sex plays are not such overstrained shockers as le marriage de olympe and damaged goods but such penetrating and excellent comedies as much ado about nothing and the taming of the shrew in much ado we have an accurate and unforgettable picture of the way in which the normal male of the human species is brought to the altar that is by the way of appealing to his hollow vanity the way of capitalizing his native and ineradicable asininity. And in The Taming of the Shrew, we have a picture of the way in which the average woman, having so snared him, is purged of her resultant vainglory and bombast, and thus reduced to decent discipline and decorum, that the marriage may go on in solid tranquillity the whole drama of sex in real life as well as on the stage revolves around these two enterprises one half of it 
consists of pitting the native intelligence of women against the native sentimentality of men and the other half consists of bringing women into a reasonable order that their superiority may not be too horribly obvious to the first division belongs to the dramas of courtship and a good many of those of marital conflict in each case the essential drama is not a tragedy but a comedy nay a farce in each case the conflict is not between imperishable verities but between mere vanities and pretensions this is the essence of the comic the unmasking of fraud its destruction by worse fraud marriage as we know it in christendom though its utility is obvious and its necessity is at least arguable is just such a series of frauds it begins with the fraud that the impulse to it is lofty unearthly and disinterested it proceeds to the fraud that both parties are equally eager for it and equally benefited by it which actually happens only when two mundis come together and it rests thereafter upon the fraud that what is once agreeable or tolerable remains agreeable ever thereafter that i shall be exactly the same man in nineteen thirty eight that i am to-day and that my wife will be the same woman and intrigued by the merits of the same man this last assumption is so outrageous that on purely evidential and logical grounds not even the most sentimental person would support it it thus becomes necessary to reinforce it by attaching it to the concept of honor that is to say it is held up not on the ground that it is actually true but on the ground that a recognition of its truth is part of the bargain made at the altar and that a repudiation of this bargain would be dishonorable here we have honor which is based upon a sense of the deepest and most inviolable truth brought in to support something admittedly not true here in other words we have a situation in comedy almost exactly parallel to that in which a colored bishop whoops onward christian soldiers like a calliopean order to drown out the crowing of the rooster concealed beneath his chasuble in all plays of the sort that are regarded as strong and significant in greenwich village in the finishing schools and by the newspaper critics connubial infidelity is the chief theme smith having a wife mrs smith betrays her love and trust by running off with miss rabinowitz his stenographer or mrs brown detecting her husband mr brown in lamentable proceedings with a neighbor the grass widow kraus forgives him and continues to be true to him in consideration of her children fred pansy and little fern both situations produce a great deal of eye-rolling and snuffing among the softies aforesaid yet neither contains the slightest touch of tragedy and neither at bottom is even honest both on the contrary are based upon an assumption that is unsound and ridiculous the assumption to wit that the position of the injured wife is grounded upon the highest idealism that the injury she suffers is directed at her lofty and impeccable spirit that it leaves her standing in an heroic attitude all this soberly examined is found to be untrue the fact is that her moving impulse is simply a desire to cut a good figure before her world 
in brief that plain vanity is what animates her this public expectation that she will endure and renounce is itself hollow and sentimental and so much so that it can seldom stand much strain if for example her heroism goes beyond a certain modest point if she carries it to the extent of complete abnegation and self-sacrifice her reward is not that she is thought heroic but that she is thought weak and foolish and if by any chance the external pressure upon her is removed and she is left to go on with her alleged idealism alone if say her recreant husband dies and some new suitor enters to dispute the theory of her deathless fidelity then it is regarded as downright insane for her to continue playing her artificial part in frank comedy we see the situation more accurately dealt with and hence more honestly and more instructively instead of depicting one party as revolting against the assumption of eternal fidelity melodramatically and the other as facing the revolt heroically and tragically we have both criticizing it by a good-humored flouting of it not necessarily by act but by attitude this attitude is normal and sensible it rests upon genuine human traits and tendencies it is sound natural and honest it gives the comedy of the stage a high validity that the bombastic fustian of the stage can never show all the sophomores to the contrary notwithstanding when i speak of infidelity of course i do not mean only the gross infidelity of strong sex plays and the divorce courts but that lighter infidelity which relieves and makes bearable the burdens of theoretical fidelity in brief the natural reaction of human nature against an artificial and preposterous assumption the assumption is that a sexual choice once made is irrevocable more that all desire to revoke it even transiently disappears the fact is that no human choice can ever be of that irrevocable character and that the very existence of such an assumption is a constant provocation to challenge it and rebel against it what we have in marriage actually or in any other such contract is a constant war between the impulse to give that rebellion objective reality and a social pressure which puts a premium on submission the rebel if he strikes out at once collides with a solid wall the bricks of which are made up of the social assumption of his docility and the mortar of which is the frozen sentimentality of his own lost yesterday his fatuous assumption that what was once agreeable to him would always be agreeable to him here we have the very essence of comedy a situation almost exactly parallel to that of the pompous old gentleman who kicks a plug hat lying on the sidewalk and stubs his toe against the cobblestone within under the whole of the conventional assumption reposes an assumption even more foolish to wit that sexual choice is regulated by some transcendental process that a mysterious accuracy gets into it that it is limited by impenetrable powers that there is for every man one certain woman this sentimentality not only underlies the theory of marriage but is also the chief apology for divorce nothing could be more ridiculous the truth is that marriages 
in christendom are determined not by elective affinities but by the most trivial accidents and that the issue of those accidents is relatively unimportant that is to say a normal man could be happy with any one of at least two dozen women of his acquaintance and a man specially fitted to accept the false assumptions of marriage could be happy with almost any presentable woman of his race class and age he is married to marie instead of to gladys because marie definitely decided to marry him whereas gladys vacillated between him and some other and marie decided to marry him instead of some other not because the impulse was irresistibly stronger but simply because the thing seemed more feasible in such choices at least among women there is often not even any self-delusion they see the facts clearly and even if later on they are swathed in sentimental trappings the revelation is not entirely obliterated here we have comedy double distilled a combat of pretensions on the one side perhaps risen to self-hallucination but on the other side more or less uneasily conscious and deliberate this is the true soul of high farce this is something not to snuffle over but to roar at End of chapter 16chapter 17 of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org prejudices first series by h l mencken george jean nathan thinks of gordon craig not as a jester but as a very serious and even solemn fellow for a dozen years past all the more sober dramatic critics of america have approached him with the utmost politeness and to the gushing old maids and auto intoxicated professors of the drama league of america he has stood for the last word in theatrical aestheticism moreover a good deal of this veneration has been deserved for craig has done excellent work in the theatre and is a man of much force and ingenuity and no little originality nevertheless there must be some flavour of low bar-room wit in him some echo of sir toby belch and the captain of kirpenick for a year or so ago he shook up his admirers with a joke most foul need i say that i refer to the notorious nathan affair imagine the scene the campus archers and walkleys in ponderous conclave perhaps preparing their monthly cablegram of devotion to metterlink arrives now a messenger with dreadful news gordon craig from his far-off italian retreat has issued a bull praising nathan which nathan george jean of course what the smart set scaramouche the ribald fellow the raffish mocker with his praise of florence ziegfeld his naughty enthusiasm for pretty legs his contumacious scoffing at brio belasco augustus thomas mrs fisk ay even so and what has craig to say of him in brief that he is the only american dramatic critic worth reading that he knows far more about the theatre than all the honorary pallbearers of criticism rolled together that he is immeasurably the superior in learning in sense in shrewdness in candour in plausibility in skill at writing of but names do not matter craig in fact did not bother to rehearse them he simply made a clean sweep of the board and then deftly placed the somewhat disconcerted nathan in the centre of the vacant space it was a sad day for the honest donkeys who for half a decade had been laboriously establishing craig's authority in america but 
it was a glad day for knopf the publisher knopf at the moment had just issued nathan's the popular theatre at once he rushed to a job printer in eighth avenue ordered one hundred thousand copies of the craig encomium and flooded the country with them the result was amusing and typical of the republic nathan's previous books when praised at all had been praised faintly and with reservations the fellow it appeared was too spoofish he lacked the sobriety and dignity necessary to a true critic he was entertaining but not to be taken seriously but now with foreign backing and particularly english backing he suddenly began to acquire merit and even a certain vague solemnity and the popular theatre was reviewed more lavishly and more favorably than i have ever seen any other theatre book reviewed before or since the phenomenon as i say was typical the childish mass of superstitions passing for civilized opinion in america was turned inside out overnight by one authoritative foreign voice i have myself been a figure in the same familiar process all of my books up to the american language were in the main hostilely noticed a book of prefaces in particular was manhandled by the orthodox reviewers then just before the american language was issued the mercure de france printed an article commending a book of prefaces in high astounding terms the consequence was that the american language a far inferior work was suddenly discovered to be full of merit and critics of the utmost respectability who had ignored all my former books printed extremely friendly reviews of it but to return to nathan what deceived the drama leaguers and other such imposing popinjays for so long causing them to mistake him for a mere sublimated allen dale was his refusal to take imbecilities seriously his easy casualness and avoidance of pedagogics his frank delight in the theatre as a show shop above all his bellicose iconoclasm and devastating wit what craig an intelligent man discerned underneath was his extraordinary capacity for differentiating between sham and reality his catholic freedom from formulae and prejudice his astonishing acquaintance with the literature of the practical theatre his firm grounding in rational aesthetic theory above all his capacity for making the thing he writes of interesting his uncommon craftsmanship this craftsmanship had already got him a large audience he had been for half a dozen years indeed one of the most widely read of american dramatic critics but the traditional delusion that sagacity and dullness are somehow identical had obscured the hard and accurate thinking that made the show what was so amusing seemed necessarily superficial it remained for craig to show that this appearance of superficiality was only an appearance that the nathan criticism was well planned and soundly articulated that at the heart of it there was a sound theory of the theatre and of the literature of the theatre no less and what was that theory you will find it nowhere put into a ready formula but the outlines of it must surely be familiar to anyone who has read another book on the theatre the popular theatre and mr george g nathan presents in brief it is the doctrine preached with so much ardor by benedetto croce and his disciple dr j e springarn and by them borrowed from goethe and carlyle the doctrine to wit that every work of art is at bottom unique and that it is the business of the critic not to label it and pigeonhole it but to seek for its inner intent and content and to value it according as that intent is carried out and that content is valid and worth while this is the precise opposite of the academic critical attitude 
the professor is nothing if not a maker of card indexes he must classify or be damned his masterpiece is the dictum that it is excellent but it is not a play nathan has a far more intelligent and hospitable eye his criterion elastic and undefined is inimical only to the hollow the meretricious the fraudulent it bars out the play of flabby and artificial sentiment it bars out the cheap melodrama however gaudily set forth it bars out the moony mush of the bad imitators of ibsen and matterlink it bars out all mere claptrap and sensation monging but it lets in every play however conceived or designed that contains an intelligible idea well worked out it lets in every play by a dramatist who is ingenious and original and genuinely amusing and it lets in every other sort of theatrical spectacle that has an honest aim and achieves that aim passably and is presented frankly for what it is bear this theory in mind and you have a clear explanation of nathan's actual performances first his merciless lampooning of the trade goods of broadway and the pifflings of the drama league geniuses and secondly his ardent championing of such widely diverse men as avery hopwood florence ziegfeld ludwig thoma lord dunsany sasha gitry lothar schmidt ferenz molnar roberto bracco and gerhard hauptmann all of whom have one thing in common they are intelligent and full of ideas and know their trade in europe of course there are many more such men than in america and some of the least of them are almost as good as our best that is why nathan is forever announcing them and advocating the presentation of their works not because he favors foreignness for its own sake but because it is so often accompanied by sound achievement and by stimulating example to our own artists and that is why when he tackles the maudlin flubdub of the broadway dons he does it with the weapons of comedy and even of farce does an augustus thomas rise up with his corn doctor magic and sunday school platitudes proving heavily that love is mightier than the sword that a pure heart will baffle the electric chair that the eye is quicker than the hand then nathan proceeds against him with a slapstick and makes excellent practice upon his pantaloons does a belasco thumb on forelock posture before the yeomanry as a great artist the evidence being a large chromo of a child's restaurant and a studio like a madison avenue antique shop then nathan flings a laugh at him and puts him in his place and does some fat rhinoceros of an actress unearthing a smutty play by a corn-fed racine loose its banal obscenities upon the vulgar in the name of sex hygiene presuming thus to teach a great lesson and to break the conspiracy of silence and carry on the noble work of brio and company and so save impatient flappers from the moloch's sacrifice of the altar does such a bumptious and preposterous baggage fill the newspapers with her pish-posh and the largest theatre in manhattan with eager dunderheads then the ribald jean has at her with a flour-sack filled with the pollen of the ambrosia artemisia folia driving her from the scene to the tune of her own unearthly sneezing necessarily he has to lay on with frequency for one honest play honestly produced and honestly played broadway sees two dozen that are simply so much green goods to devote serious exposition to the badness of such stuff would be to descend to the donkeyish futility of william winter sometimes indeed even ridicule is not enough there must be a briefer and more dramatic display of the essential banality well then why not recreate it in the manner of croce but touching up a line here a color there 
the result is burlesque but burlesque that is the most searching and illuminating sort of criticism who will forget nathan's demonstration that a platitudinous play by thomas would be better if played backward a superb bravura piece enormously beyond the talents of any other american writer on the theatre it smashed the thomas legend with one stroke in the little volume called bottoms up you will find many other such annihilating waggeries nathan does not denounce melodrama with a black cap upon his head painfully demonstrating its inferiority to the drama of ibsen scribe and euripides he simply sits down and writes a little melodrama so extravagantly ludicrous that the whole genus collapses and he does not prove in four columns of a sunday paper that french plays done into american are spoiled he simply shows the spoiling in six lines this method of course makes for broken heads it outrages the feelings of tender theatrical mountebanks it provokes reprisals more or less furtive and behind the door the theatre in america as in most other countries is operated chiefly by bounders men so constantly associated with actors tend to take on the qualities of the actor his idiotic vanity his herculean stupidity his chronic underrating of his betters the miasma spreads to dramatists and dramatic critics the former drift into charlatanry and the latter into a cowardly and disgusting dishonesty amid such scenes a man of positive ideas of civilized tastes and of unshakable integrity is a stranger and he must face all the hostility that the lower orders of men display to strangers there is so far as i know no tripe seller in broadway who has not tried at one time or another to dispose of nathan by attentat he has been exposed to all the measures ordinarily effective against rebellious reviewers and resisting them he has been treated to special treatment with infernal machines of novel and startling design no writer for the theatre has been harder beset and none has been less incommoded by the onslaught what is more he has never made the slightest effort to capitalize this drum fire the invariable device of lesser men so far as i am aware and i have been in close association with him for ten years it has had not the slightest effect upon him whatsoever a thoroughgoing skeptic with no trace in him of the messianic delusion he has avoided timorousness on the one hand and indignation on the other no man could be less a public martyr of the metcalf type it would probably amuse him vastly to hear it argued that his unbreakable independence and often somewhat high and mighty sniffishness has been of any public usefulness i sometimes wonder what keeps such a man in the theatre breathing bad air nightly gaping at prancing imbeciles sitting cheek by jowl with cads perhaps there is at bottom a secret romanticism a lingering residuum of a boyish delight in pasteboard and spangles gaudy colours and soothing sounds preposterous heroes and appetizing wenches but more likely it is a sense of humour the zest of a man to whom life is a spectacle that never grows dull a show infinitely surprising amusing buffoonish vulgar obscene the theatre when all is said and done is not life in miniature but life enormously magnified life hideously exaggerated its emotions are ten times as powerful as those of reality its ideas are twenty times as idiotic as those of real men its lights and colours and sounds are forty times as blinding and deafening as those of nature its people are grotesque burlesques of every one we know here is diversion for a cynic and here it may be is the explanation of nathan's fidelity 
whatever the cause of his enchantment it seems to be lasting to a man so fertile in ideas and so facile in putting them into words there is a constant temptation to make experiments to plunge into strange waters to seek self-expression in ever-widening circles and yet at the brink of forty years nathan remains faithful to the theatre of his half-dozen books only one does not deal with it and that one is a very small one in four or five years he has scarcely written of aught else i doubt that anything properly describable as enthusiasm is at the bottom of this assiduity perhaps the right word is curiosity he is interested mainly not in the staple fare of the playhouse but in what might be called its fancy goods in its endless stream of new men its restless innovations the radical overhauling that it has been undergoing in our time i do not recall in any of his books or articles a single paragraph appraising the classics of the stage or more than a brief note or two on their interpretation his attention is always turned in a quite opposite direction he is intensely interested in novelty of whatever sort if it be only free from sham such experimentalists as max reinhardt george bernard shaw sasha gitry and the daring nobodies of the grand guignol such divergent originals as dunsany ziegfeld george m cohan and schnitzler have enlisted his eager partisanship he saw something new to our theatre in the farces of hopwood before any one else saw it he was quick to welcome the novel points of view of eleanor gates and claire cummer he at once rescued what was sound in the little theatre movement from what was mere attitudinizing and pseudo-intellectuality in the view of broadway an exigent and even malignant fellow wielding a pen dipped in aqua fortis he is actually amiable to the last degree and constantly announces pearls in the fodder of the swine is the new play in forty-second street a serious work of art as the press agents and the newspaper reviewers say then so are your grandmother's false teeth is Metterlink a great thinker then so is dr frank crane is belasco a profound artist then so is the man who designs the ceilings of hotel dining-rooms but let us not weep too soon in the play around the corner there is a clever scene next door amid sickening dullness there are two buffoons who could be worse one clouts the other with a blutwurst filled with mayonnaise and a block away there is a girl in the second row with a very charming twist of the vastus medialis let us sniff the roses and forget the thorns what this attitude chiefly wars with even above cheapness meretriciousness and banality is the fatuous effort to turn the theatre a place of amusement into a sort of outhouse to the academic grove the matterlink brio barker complex no critic in america and none in england save perhaps walkley has combated this movement more vigorously than nathan he is under no illusion as to the functions and limitations of the stage he knows with victor hugo that the best it can do in the domain of ideas is to turn thoughts into food for the crowd and he knows that only the simplest and shakiest ideas may undergo that transformation coming upon the scene at the height of the ibsen mania of half a generation ago he ranged himself against its windy pretenses from the start he saw at once the high merit of ibsen as a dramatic craftsman and welcomed him as a reformer of dramatic technique but he also saw how platitudinous was the ideational content of his plays and announced the fact in terms highly offensive to the ibsenites but the ibsenites have vanished and nathan remains he has survived too the brio hubbub 
he has lived to preach the funeral sermon of the belasco legend he has himself sordid matterlink and granville barker he has done frightful execution upon many a poor mime and meanwhile breasting the murky tide of professorial buncombe of solemn pontificating of richard burtonism clayton hamiltonism and other such decaying forms of william winterism he has rescued dramatic criticism among us from its exile with theology embalming and obstetrics and given it a place among what nietzsche called the gay sciences along with war fiddle-playing and laparotomy he has made it amusing stimulating challenging even at times a bit startling and to the business artfully concealed he has brought a sound and thorough acquaintance with the heavy work of the pioneers lessing schlegel hazlitt lewes et al and an even wider acquaintance lavishly displayed with every nook and corner of the current theatrical scene across the water and to discharge this extraordinarily copious mass of information he has hauled and battered the english language into new and often astounding forms and when english has failed he has helped it out with french german italian american swedish russian turkish latin sanskrit and old church slavic and with algebraic symbols chemical formulae musical notation and the signs of the zodiac this manner of course is not without its perils a man so inordinately articulate is bound to succumb now and then to the seductions of mere virtuosity the average writer and particularly the average critic of the drama does well if he gets a single new and racy phrase into an essay nathan does well if he dilutes his inventions with enough commonplaces to enable the average reader to understand his discourse at all he carries the avoidance of the cliche to the length of an idee fix it would be difficult in all his books to find a dozen of the usual rubber stamps of criticism i dare say it would kill him or at all events bring him down with cholera morbus to discover that he had called a play convincing or found authority in the snorting of an english actor manager at best this incessant flight from the obvious makes for a piquant and arresting style a procession of fantastic and often highly pungent neologisms in brief for nathanism at worst it becomes artificiality pedantry obscurity i cite an example from an essay on eleanor gates's the poor little rich girl prefaced to the printed play as against the not unhallow symbolic strut and gasconade of such overpained pieces as let us for example say the bluebird of matterlink so simple and unaffected a bit of stage writing as this of school dramatic intrinsically the same cajoles the more honest heart and satisfies more plausibly and fully those of us whose thumbs are ever being pulled professionally for a native stage less smeared with the snobberies of empty albeit high-sounding nomenclatures from overseas fancy that hedda and in praise of a simple and unaffected bit of stage writing i denounced it at the time circa nineteen sixteen and perhaps with some effect at all events i seem to notice a gradual disentanglement of the parts of speech the old florid invention is still there one encounters startling coinages in even the most casual of reviews the thing still flashes and glitters the tune is yet upon the e-string but underneath i hear a more sober rhythm than of old the fellow in fact takes on a sedater habit both in style and in point of view without abandoning anything essential without making the slightest concession to the orthodox opinion that he so magnificently disdains 
he yet begins to yield to the middle years the mere shocking of the stupid is no longer as charming as it used to be what he now offers is rather more gemutlich sometimes it even verges upon the instructive but i doubt that nathan will ever become a professor even if he enjoys the hideously prolonged senility of a william winter he will be full of surprises to the end with his last gasp he will make a phrase to flabbergast a dolt end of chapter seventeen recording by linda johnson Chapter 18 of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken. Portrait of an Immortal Soul. One day in spring, six or eight years ago, i received a letter from a man somewhere beyond the wabash announcing that he had lately completed a very powerful novel and hinting that my critical judgment upon it would give him great comfort such notifications at that time reached me far too often to be agreeable and so i sent him a form response telling him that i was ill with pleurisy had just been forbidden by my oculist to use my eyes and was about to become a father the aim of this form response was to shunt all that sort of trade off to other reviewers but for once it failed that is to say the unknown kept on writing to me and finally offered to pay me an honorarium for my labor this offer was so unusual that it quite demoralized me and before i could recover i had received cashed and dissipated a modest check and was confronted by an accusing manuscript perhaps four inches thick but growing thicker every time i glanced at it one night tortured by conscience and by the inquiries and reminders arriving from the author by every post i took up the sheets and settled down for a depressing hour or two of it no i did not read all night no it was not a masterpiece no it has not made the far-off stranger famous let me tell the story quite honestly i am in fact far too rapid a reader to waste a whole night on a novel i had got through this one by midnight and was sound asleep at my usual time and it was by no means a masterpiece on the contrary it was inchoate clumsy and in part artificial insincere and preposterous and to this day the author remains obscure but underneath all the amateurish writing the striving for effects that failed to come off the absurd literary self-consciousness the recurrent falsity and banality underneath all these stigmata of a neophyte's book there was yet a capital story unusual in content naive in manner and enormously engrossing what is more the faults that it showed in execution were most of them not ineradicable on page after page as i read on i saw chances to improve it to get rid of its intermittent bathos to hasten its action to eliminate its spells of fine writing to purge it of its imitations of all the bad novels ever written in brief to tighten it organize it and as the painters say tease it up the result was that i spent the next morning writing the author a long letter of advice it went to him with the manuscript and for weeks i heard nothing from him then the manuscript returned and i read it again this time i had a genuine surprise not only had the unknown followed my suggestions with much intelligence in addition once set up on the right track he had devised a great many excellent improvements of his own in its new form in fact the thing was a very competent and even dexterous piece of writing and after re-reading it from the first word to the last with even keener interest than before i sent it to mitchell kennerly then an active publisher and asked him to look through it 
Kennerly made an offer for it at once, and eight or nine months later it was published with his imprint. The author chose to conceal himself behind the nom de plume of Robert Steele. I myself gave the book the title of One Man. It came from the press, and straightway died the death. The only favorable review it received was mine in The Smart Set. No other reviewer paid any heed to it. No one gabbled about it. No one, so far as I could make out, even read it. The sale was small from the start, and quickly stopped altogether. To this day the fact fills me with wonder. To this day I marvel that so dramatic, so penetrating, and so curiously moving a story should have failed so overwhelmingly. For I have never been able to convince myself that I was wrong about it. On the contrary, I am more certain than ever, re-reading it after half a dozen years, that I was right, that it was and is one of the most honest and absorbing human documents ever printed in America. I have called it, following the author, a novel. It is, in fact, nothing of the sort. It is autobiography. More, it is autobiography unadorned and shameless, autobiography almost unbelievably cruel and betraying, autobiography that is as devoid of artistic sophistication as an operation for gallstones. This so-called steel is simply too stupid, too ingenuous, too moral to lie. He is the very reverse of an artist. He is a born and incurable Puritan, and in his alleged novel he draws the most faithful and merciless picture of an American Puritan that has ever got upon paper. There is never the slightest effort at amelioration. He never evades the ghastly horror of it. He never tries to palm off himself as a good fellow, a hero. Instead, he simply takes his stand in the center of the platform, where all the spotlights meet, and there calmly strips off his raiment of reticence. First his Sunday plug hat, then his long-tailed coat, then his boiled shirt, then his shoes and socks, and finally his very BVDs. The closing scene shows the authentic mensch an sich, the eternal blue nose in the nude with every wart and pimple glittering, and every warped bone and flabby muscle telling its abhorrent tale. There stands the Puritan, stripped of every artifice and concealment, like Thackeray's Louis the Fourteenth. Searching my memory, I can drag up no recollection of another such self-opener of secret chambers and skeletonic closets. Set beside this pious babbler, the late Giovanni Jacopo Casanova de Seingalt shrinks to the puny proportions of a mere barroom boaster, a smoking car Don Juan, an eighteenth century stock company leading man or whiskey drummer. So too Benvenuto Cellini, a fellow vastly entertaining, true enough, but after all, not so much a psychological historian as a liar, a yellow journalist. One always feels in reading Benvenuto that the man who is telling the story is quite distinct from the man about whom it is being told. The fellow, indeed, was too noble an artist to do a mere portrait with fidelity. He could not resist the temptation to repair a cauliflower ear here, to paint out a tell-tale scar there, to shine up the eyes a bit, to straighten the legs down below. But this Steele, or whatever his name may be, never steps out of himself. He is never describing the gaudy one he would like to be, but always the commonplace, the weak, the emotional, the ignorant, the third-rate Christian male that he actually is. He deplores himself. He distrusts himself. He plainly wishes heartily that he was not himself but he never makes the slightest attempt to disguise and bedizen himself. Such as he is, cheap, mawkish, unesthetic, conscience-stricken, he depicts himself with fierce and unrelenting honesty. Superficially, 
the man that he sets before us seems to be a felonious fellow for he confesses frankly to a long series of youthful larcenies to a somewhat banal adventure in forgery leading to a term in jail to sundry petty deceits and breaches of trust and to an almost endless chain of exploits in amour most of them sordid and unrelieved by anything approaching romance but the inner truth about him of course is that he is really a moralist of the moralists that his one fundamental and all-embracing virtue is what he himself regards as his viciousness that he is never genuinely human and likable save in those moments which lead swiftly to his most florid self-accusing in brief the history is that of a moral young man the child of god-fearing parents and its moral if it has one is that a strictly moral upbringing injects poisons into the system that even the most steadfast morality cannot resist it is in a way the old story of the preacher's son turned sot and cutthroat here we see an apparently sound and normal youngster converted into a sneak and rogue by the intolerable pressure of his father's abominable puritanism and once a rogue we see him make himself into a scoundrel by the very force of his horror of his roguery every step downward is helped from above it is not until he resigns himself frankly to the fact of his incurable degradation and so ceases to struggle against it that he ever steps out of it the external facts of the chronicle are simple enough the son of a schoolteacher turned petty lawyer and politician the hero is brought up under such barbaric rigors that he has already become a fluent and ingenious liar in sheer self-protection at the age of five or six from lying he proceeds quite naturally to stealing he lifts a few dollars from a neighbor and then rifles a tin bank and then takes to filching all sorts of small articles from the storekeepers of the vicinage his harsh stupid christian father getting wind of these peccadilloes has at him in the manner of a mad bull beating him screaming at him half killing him the boy for all the indecent cruelty of it is convinced of the justice of it he sees himself as one lost he accepts the fact that he is a disgrace to his family in the end he embraces the parental theory that there is something strange and sinister in his soul that he couldn't be good if he tried finally filled with some vague notion of taking his abhorrent self out of sight he runs away from home brought back in the character of a felon he runs away again soon he is a felon in fact that is to say he forges his father's name to a sheaf of checks and his father allows him to go to prison this prison term gives the youngster a chance to think things out for himself without the constant intrusion of his father's presbyterian notions of right or wrong the result is a measurably saner philosophy than that he absorbed at home but there is still enough left of the old moral obsession to cripple him in all his thinking and especially in his thinking about himself his attitude toward women for example is constantly conditioned by puritanical misgivings and superstitions he can never view them innocently joyously unmorally as a young fellow of twenty or twenty-one should but is always oppressed by sunday schoolish notions of his duty to them and to society in general on the one hand he is appalled by his ready yielding to those hussies who have at him unofficially and on the other hand he is filled with the idea that it would be immoral for him an ex-convict to go to the altar with a virgin the result of these doubts is that he gives a good deal more earnest thought to the woman question than is good for him the second result is that he proves an easy victim to the discarded mistress of his employer 
this worthy working girl craftily snares him and marries him and then breaks down on their wedding night unwomaned so to speak by the pathetic innocence of the ass and confesses to a choice role of her past doings ending with the news that she is suffering from what the vice crusaders mellifluously denominate a social disease naturally enough the blow almost kills the poor boy he is still in fact scarcely out of his nonage and the problems that grow out of the confession engage him for the better part of the next two years always he approaches them and wrestles with them morally always his search is for the way that the copybook maxims approve not for the way that self-preservation demands even when a brilliant chance for revenge presents itself and he is forced to embrace it by the sheer magnetic pull of it he does so hesitatingly doubtingly ashamedly his whole attitude to this affair indeed is that of an early christian father he hates himself for gathering rosebuds while he may he hates the woman with a double hatred for strewing them so temptingly in his path and in the end like the moral and upright fellow that he is he sells out the temptress for cash in hand and salves his conscience by handing over the money to an orphan asylum this after prayers for divine guidance a fact don't miss the story of it in the book you will go far before you get another such illuminating glimpse into a pure and righteous mind so in episode after episode one observes a constant oscillation between a pharisaical piety and a hoggish carnality the praying brother of yesterday is the night hack roisterer of today the roisterer of today is the snuffling penitent and pledge taker of tomorrow finally he is pulled both ways at once and suffers the greatest of all his tortures again of course a woman is at the centre of it this time a stenographer he has no delusions about her virtue she admits herself in fact that it is extinct but all the same he falls head over heels in love with her and is filled with an inordinate yearning to marry her and settle down with her why not indeed she is pretty and a nice girl she seems to reciprocate his affection she is naturally eager for the obliterating gold band she will undoubtedly make him an excellent wife but he has forgotten his conscience and it rises up in revenge and floors him what marry a girl with such a past take a fancy woman to his bosom jealousy quickly comes to the aid of conscience will he be able to forget contemplating the damsel in the years to come at breakfast at dinner across the domestic hearth in the cold blue dawn will he ever rid his mind of those abhorrent images those phantasms of men here at the very end we come to the most engrossing chapter in this extraordinary book the duelist of sex thrust through the gizzard at last goes off to a lonely hunting camp to wrestle with his intolerable problem he describes his vacillations faithfully elaborately cruelly on the one side he sets his honest yearning his desire to have done with light loves the girl herself on the other hand he ranges his moral qualms his sneaking distrusts the sinister shadows of those nameless ones his morganatic brothers-in-law the struggle within his soul is gigantic he suffers as prometheus suffered on the rock his very vitals are devoured he emerges battered and exhausted he decides in the end that he will marry the girl she has wasted the shining dowry of her sex she comes to him spotted and at second hand snickers will appear in the polyphony of the wedding music but he will marry her nevertheless it will be a marriage unblessed by holy writ it will be a flying in the face of moses 
luck and the archangels will be against it but he will marry her all the same moses or no moses and so with his face made bright by his first genuine revolt against the archaic barbaric morality that has dragged him down and his heart pulsing to his first display of authentic unpolluted charity generosity and nobility he takes his departure from us may the fates favor him with their mercy may the lord god strain a point to lift him out of his purgatory at last he has suffered all the agonies of belief he has done abominable penance for the westminster catechism and for the moral order of the world and for all the despairing misery of back street black bombazine little bethel goodness he is puritanism incarnate and puritanism become intolerable i dare say any second-hand bookseller will be able to find a copy of the book for you one man by robert steele there is some raciness in the detail of it perhaps despite its public failure it enjoys a measure of pizzicato esteem behind the door the author having achieved its colossal self-revelation became intrigued by the notion that he was a literary man of sorts and informed me that he was undertaking the story of the girl last named the spotted ex-virgin but he apparently never finished it no doubt he discovered before he had gone very far that the tale was intrinsically beyond him that his fingers all turned into thumbs when he got beyond his own personal history such a writer once he has told the one big story is done for end of chapter eighteen recording by linda johnson Chapter 19 of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken. Jack London. The quasi science of genealogy, as it is practiced in the United States, is directed almost exclusively toward establishing aristocratic descents for nobodies that is to say it records and glorifies decay its typical masterpiece is the discovery that the wife of some obscure county judge is the grandchild infinitely removed of mary queen of scots or that the blood of geoffrey of monmouth flows in the veins of a philadelphia stockbroker how much more profitably its professors might be employed in tracing the lineage of truly salient and distinguished men for example the late jack london where did he get his hot artistic passion his delicate feeling for form and color his extraordinary skill with words the man in truth was an instinctive artist of a high order and if ignorance often corrupted his art it only made the fact of his inborn mastery the more remarkable no other popular writer of his time did any better writing than you will find in the call of the wild or in parts of john barleycorn or in such short stories as the sea farmer and samuel here indeed are all the elements of sound fiction clear thinking a sense of character the dramatic instinct and above all the adept putting together of words words charming and slyly significant words arranged in a french phrase for the respiration and the ear you will never convince me that this aesthetic sensitiveness so rare so precious so distinctively aristocratic burst into a biogenetic flower on a san francisco sandlot there must have been some intrusion of an alien and superior strain some pianissimo fill-up from above there was obviously a great deal more to the thing than a routine hatching in low life perhaps the explanation is to be sought in a jewish smear jews were not few in the california of a generation ago 
and one of them at least attained to a certain high if transient fame with the pen moreover the name london has a jewish smack the jews like to call themselves after great cities i have indeed heard this possibility of an old testament descent put into an actual rumor stranger genealogies are not unknown in seaports but london the artist did not live a cappella there was also london the amateur great thinker and the second often hamstrung the first that great thinking of his of course took color from the sordid misery of his early life it was in the main a jejune socialism wholly uncriticized by humor some of his propagandist and expository books are almost unbelievably nonsensical and whenever he allowed any of his so-called ideas to sneak into an imaginative work the intrusion promptly spoiled it socialism in truth is quite incompatible with art its cook tent materialism is fundamentally at war with the first principle of the aesthetic gospel which is that one daffodil is worth ten shares of bethlehem steel it is not by accident that there has never been a book on socialism which was also a work of art papa marx's das kapital at once comes to mind it is as wholly devoid of graces as the origin of species or science and health one simply cannot conceive a reasonable man reading it without aversion it is as revolting as a barrel organ london preaching socialism or quasi-socialism or whatever it was that he preached took over this offensive dullness the materialistic conception of history was too heavy a load for him to carry when he would create beautiful books he had to throw it overboard as wagner threw overboard democracy the superman and free thought a sort of temporary christian created parsifal a sort of temporary aristocrat created the call of the wild also in another way london's early absorption of social and economic nostrums damaged him as an artist it led him into a socialistic exaltation of mere money it put a touch of avarice into him hence his too deadly industry his relentless thousand words a day his steady emission of half-done books the prophet of freedom he yet sold himself into slavery to the publishers and paid off with his soul for his ranch his horses his trappings of a wealthy cheesemonger his volumes rolled out almost as fast as those of e phillips oppenheim he simply could not make them perfect at such a gait there are books on his list for example the scarlet plague and the little lady of the big house that are little more than garrulous notes for books but even in the worst of them one comes upon sudden splashes of brilliant color stray proofs of the adept penman half wistful reminders that london at bottom was no fraud he left enough i am convinced to keep him in mind there was in him a vast delicacy of perception a high feeling a sensitiveness to beauty and there was in him too under all his blatancies a poignant sense of the infinite romance and mystery of human life end of chapter nineteen recording by linda johnson chapter twenty of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org prejudices first series by h l mencken among the avatars it may be as they say that we americanos lie in the gutter of civilization but all the while our eyes steal cautious glances at the stars in the midst of the prevailing materialism the thin incense of mysticism 
as a relief from money drives, politics and the struggle for existence, Rosicrucianism, the Knights of Pythias, passwords, grips, secret work, the 33rd degree. In flight from Peruna, Mandrake pills and Fletcherism, Christian science, the Emmanuel movement, the new thought. The tendency already has its poets, Edwin Markham and Ella Wheeler Wilcox. It has acquired its romancer, Will Levington Comfort. This comfort wields an easy pen. He has done, indeed, some capital melodramas, and when his ardor heats him up, he grows downright eloquent. But of late, the whole force of his aesthetic engines has been thrown into propaganda by the Bhagavad Gita out of Victorian sentimentalism. The nature of this propaganda is quickly discerned. What comfort preaches is a sort of mellowed mariolatry, a humorless exaltation of woman, a flashy effort to turn the inter-attraction of the sexes, ordinarily a mere cause of scandal, into something transcendental and highly portentous. Woman, it appears, is the beyond man, the trans mammal, the nascent angel. She is the upward path, the way to consecration the door to the third lustrous dimension all the mysteries of the cosmos are concentrated in mystic motherhood whatever that may be i capitalize in the comfortian and new thought manner on one page of fate knocks at the door i find voices pits of trade woman the great light the big deep and the twentieth century lie on another are the rising road of man, the transcendental soul essence, the way uphill, the sempiternal mother. Thus, Andrew Bedient, the spouting hero of the tale, I believe in the natural greatness of woman, that through the spirit of woman are born sons of strength, that only through the potential greatness of woman comes the militant greatness of man i believe mothering is the loveliest of the arts that great mothers are handmaidens of the spirit to whom are entrusted god's avatars that no prophet is greater than his mother i believe when humanity arises to spiritual evolution as it once evolved through flesh and is now evolving through mind woman will assume the ethical guiding of the race. I believe that the Holy Spirit of the Trinity is mystic motherhood, and the source of the divine principle is woman, that the prophets are the union of this divine principle and the higher manhood, that they are beyond the attractions of women of flesh, because unto their manhood has been added mystic motherhood. I believe that the way to godhood is the rising road of man i believe that as the human mother brings a child to her husband the father so mystic motherhood the holy spirit is bringing the world to god the father the capitals are andrews or comforts i merely transcribe and perspire this andrew it appears is a sea cook who has been mellowed and transfigured by exhaustive study of the bhagavad gita one of the sacred nonsense books of the hindus he doesn't know who his father was and he remembers his mother only as one dying in a strange city when she finally passed away he took to the high seas and mastered marine cookery thus for many years up and down the world then he went ashore at manila and became chef to an army pack train. Then he proceeded to China, to Japan, then to India, where he entered the forestry service and plotted the Himalayan heights, always with the Bhagavad Gita under his arm. At some time or other, during his years of culinary seafaring, he saved the life of a Yankee ship captain, and that captain, later dying, left him untold millions in South America. 
but it is long after all this is past that we have chiefly to do with him he is now a young monte cristo at large in new york a monte cristo worshipped and gurgled over by a crowd of mushy old maids a hero of you need a biscuit parties in godforsaken studios the madness and despair of senescent virgins but it is not andrew's wealth that inflames these old girls nor even his manly beauty but rather his revolutionary and astounding sapience his great gift for solemn and incomprehensible utterance his skill as a metaphysician they hang upon his every word his rhetoric makes their heads swim once he gets fully under way they almost swoon and what girls they are alas what pathetic neck stretching toward tinsel stars what eager hearing of the soulful gassy stuff one of them has red hair and quote, wine dark eyes now cryptic black now suffused with red glows like the night sky above a prairie fire end quote. another is quote, tall and lovely in a tragic flower-like way end quote, and performs upon the violoncello a third is quote, a tanned woman rather variously weathered end quote, who writes stupefying epigrams about Whitman and Nietzsche, making the latter's name Nietzsche, of course. A fourth is, quote, the gray one, end quote. Oh, mystic appellation. A fifth, but enough. You get the picture. You can imagine how Andrew's sagacity staggers these poor dears. You can see them fighting for him, each against all with sharp psychical excaliburs arm in arm with all this exaltation of woman of course goes a great suspicion of mere woman the combination is as old as christian mysticism and havelock ellis has discussed its origin and nature at great length on the one hand is the ubermensch on the other hand is the temptress the lorelei the madonna and mother eve the celestial virgins and the succubi the hero of fate knocks at the door for all his flaming words still distrusts his goddess his colleague of down among men is poisoned by the same suspicions woman has led him up to grace she has shown him the upward path she has illuminated him with her mystic motherhood but the moment she lets go his hand he takes to his heels what is worse he sends a friend to her, I forget her name and his, to explain in detail how unfavorably any further communion with her would corrupt his high mission, i.e., to save the downtrodden by writing plays that fail and books that not even Americans will read. An intellectual milk toast, a mixture of Dr. Frank Crane and Mother Tingley, of Edward Bach and the Archangel Eddie so far not much of this ineffable stuff has got among the best sellers but i believe that it is on its way despite materialism and pragmatism mysticism is steadily growing in fashion i hear of paunchy freemasons holding sacramental meetings on maundy thursday of senators in congress railing against materia medica of presidents invoking divine intercession at cabinet meetings the new thoughters march on they have at least a dozen prosperous magazines and one of them has a circulation comparable to that of any twenty-cent repository of lingerie fiction such things as karma the ineffable essence and the zeitgeist become familiar fauna chained up in the cage of every woman's club thousands of american women know far more about the subconscious than they know about plain sewing the pungency of myrrh and frankincense is mingled with odeur de femme physiology is formally repealed and repudiated its laws are all lies no doubt the fleshly best-seller of the last decade with its blushing amorousness its flashes of underwear 
its obstetrics between chapters will give place to a more delicate piece of trade goods tomorrow in this new thought novel the hero and heroine will seek each other out not to spoon obscenely behind the door but for the purpose of uplifting the race kissing is already unsanitary in a few years it may be downright sacrilegious a crime against some obscure avatar or other a business libidinous and accursed end of chapter twenty recording by linda johnson chapter twenty one of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson prejudices first series by h l mencken three american immortals one aristotelian obsequies i take the following from the boston herald of may first eighteen eighty two a beautiful floral book stood at the left of the pulpit being spread out on a stand its last page was composed of white carnations white daisies and light-colored immortelles on the leaf was displayed in neat letters of purple immortelles the word venus this device is about two feet square and its border was composed of different colored tea roses the other portion of the book was composed of dark and light-colored flowers the front of the large pulpit was covered with a mass of white pine boughs laid on loosely in the centre of this mass of boughs appeared a large harp composed of yellow jonquils above this harp was a handsome bouquet of dark pansies on each side appeared large clusters of calla lilies well what have we here the funeral of a grand exalted pishposh of the odd fellows of an east side tammany leader of an aged and much respected brothel keeper nay what we have here is the funeral of ralph waldo emerson it was thus that new england lavished the loveliest fruits of the puritan aesthetic upon the bier of her greatest son it was thus that puritan culture mourned a philosopher two edgar allan poe the myth that there is a monument to edgar allan poe in baltimore is widely believed there are even persons who stopping off in baltimore to eat oysters go to look at it as a matter of fact no such monument exists all that the explorer actually finds is a cheap and hideous tombstone in the corner of a presbyterian churchyard a tombstone quite as bad as the worst in pere la chaise for twenty-six years after poe's death there was not even this the grave remained wholly unmarked poe had surviving relatives in baltimore and they were well to do one day one of them ordered a local stonecutter to put a plain stone over the grave the stonecutter hacked it out and was preparing to haul it to the churchyard when a runaway freight train smashed into his stone yard and broke the stone to bits thereafter the poe seemed to have forgotten cousin edgar at all events nothing further was done the existing tombstone was erected by a committee of baltimore school marms and cost about one thousand dollars it took the dear girls ten long years to raise the money they started out with a literary entertainment which yielded three hundred eighty dollars this was in eighteen sixty five six years later the fund had made such slow progress that with accumulated interest it came to but five hundred eighty seven dollars and two cents three years more went by it now reached six hundred twenty seven dollars fifty five cents then some anonymous poista came down with one hundred dollars two others gave fifty dollars each one of the devoted school marms raised fifty two dollars in nickels and dimes and george w childs agreed to pay any remaining deficit during all this time not a single american author of position gave the project any aid and when finally a stone was carved and set up and the time came for the unveiling the only one who appeared at the ceremony was walt whitman 
All the other persons present were Baltimore nobodies, chiefly school teachers and preachers. There were three set speeches, one by the principal of a local high school, the second by a teacher in the same seminary, and the third by a man who was invited to give his personal recollections of Poe, but who announced in his third sentence that, I never saw Poe but once, and our interview did not last an hour. This was the gaudiest Poe celebration ever held in America. The poet has never enjoyed such august posthumous attentions as those which lately flattered the shade of James Russell Lowell. In his actual burial in 1849, exactly eight persons were present, of whom six were relatives. He was planted, as I have said, in a Presbyterian churchyard among generations of honest believers in infant damnation, but the officiating clergyman was a Methodist. Two days after his death, a Baptist gentleman of God, the illustrious Rufus W. Griswold, printed a defamatory article upon him in the New York Tribune and for years it set the tone of native criticism of him. And so he rests, thrust among Presbyterians by a Methodist and formally damned by a Baptist. 3. Memorial Service Let us summon from the shades of the immortal soul of James Harlan, born in 1820, entered into rest in 1899. In the year 1865, this Harlan resigned from the United States Senate to enter the cabinet of Abraham Lincoln as Secretary of the Interior. One of the clerks in that department, at $600 a year, was Walt Whitman, lately emerged from three years of hard service as an army nurse during the Civil War. One day, discovering that Whitman was the author of a book called Leaves of Grass, Harlan ordered him incontinently kicked out and it was done forthwith. Let us remember this event and this man. He is too precious to die. Let us repair once a year to our accustomed houses of worship, and there give thanks to God that one day in 1865 brought together the greatest poet that America has ever produced and the damnedest ass. End of chapter 21 End of Prejudice's first series by H. L. Mencken.